All right. Uh, okay, welcome to the DDPS seminar, everyone. Before we introduce our invited speaker, let's go over uh, some rules and logistics. Uh, first of all, please mute yourself during the talk unless you have questions. If you have questions, you are welcome to mute and ask. Uh, otherwise, please use chat room to post your questions so that we can address them in Q&A session at the end. Second, today's DDPS seminar is open to external audiences, therefore no classified discussion is allowed, so please watch out. Finally, the talk today will be recorded and uploaded in our YouTube channel. That's about it. Now let me introduce our speaker today. It is an honor to host uh, Jan Dugona, who is a senior data scientist and the principal investigator in the physics and computational science uh, division at uh, PNNL. Uh, Jan has a PhD in control engineering from the Slovak University of Technology in Blat Blatislava, Slovakia. And before joining PNNL, he was a postdoc at the mechanical engineering department at KU Leuven in Belgium. His current research is fo focused on differential, differentiable programming for scientific machine learning, constrained optimization, and model-based optimal control with applications in the energy sector, including building uh, control and power systems optimization. Today, Jan will talk about differentiable, uh, differential uh, programming for modeling and control of dynamical systems, which is very interesting topic. So please enjoy. Uh, now, without further ado, uh, let me pass the button to Jan by asking one random question. As usual, today's random question is, uh, what is the most beautiful place you have ever seen? Uh, it's very, very difficult to answer, but uh, I will be a little bit territorial right now in Washington State, and I really fall in love with Washington State because of the mountains, uh, such as Mount Rainier, and untouched nature, glaciers, cascades. Everyone should visit and fetch me an email if you're in the area, we can go on a hike. Awesome. Okay, so I guess you love hiking. Uh, oh, very much so. Nature right. is the best place to stay. I totally agree. All right. Okay, stage is yours, Jan. Yeah. Thank you very much, Jungshko, for this wonderful um, introduction and uh, also unexpected random question and uh, for for having me it's a really great honor to um, be invited to, uh, as a speaker to this uh, seminar which i was following uh, throughout the year with great content uh, today i want to present the perspective of the broader team at pnl which uh, is consisting of people from deep learning background power system background aerospace, uh, electrical engineering, control engineering, that is working together on developing differential programming methods for modeling and control of dynamic systems, uh, with uh, the first challenge being system modeling. Simulations are crucial for many areas of decision-making and scientific discovery, and national labs in general are uh, primed to develop large-scale, high-fidelity simulation models and data-driven models for complex engineering systems such as power system networks, building energy systems, or or unmanned vehicles uh, for underwater uh, measurements. And there is a need to improve the computational efficiency and scalability of heterogeneous scientific simulations. Classically, you are solving uh, physics-based models with numerical methods, but recently there is a new trend of bringing more machine learning in, in place and replacing iterative solvers with neural networks and a lot of new exciting uh, area of research of uh, hybrid architectures with physics-informed uh, neural networks or machine learning. In our team, we are on, on, on the track of objectives of developing domain agnostic software tools and algorithmic frameworks that could combine these scientific computing methods with data science models and uh, be supported by high performance computing available at national labs. There are a lot of applications in optimization modeling of dynamic systems, uh, such as optimal control. In general, there are like two branches of control, model based and model free. A flagship of model based control is called model predictive control. And there is a 
this statement from the Richard Murray from Caltech uh, textbook on optimal control that says 95% of industrial control applications are PID control loops or proportional integral derivative controllers. There are just three parameters, very simple, single input, single output controllers. The rest is model predictive control. Why, why such a success of model-based approaches in industry, such as process control, automotive, aerospace, or high-performance robotics? Because the safety is number one. Performance in terms of the economical performance uh, or, or time is number two. Um, and typically, these systems can be approximated by relatively lower order dynamical system models like differential equations or state space models. And you can have reliable prior knowledge to build these physics based models. And you have typically budget to employ army of PhDs to write down your differential equations, constraint optimization problems, or solve these problems uh, with modern numerical methods. On the other hand, when you don't know, the underlying physics or it's too expensive to obtain, like for large power system networks, we need to do something else. Um, reinforcement learning has been very successful in domains where you have reliable digital environment model, like computer games or board games, or uh, some complex simulation models that don't necessarily need to be differentiable or have specific properties that are required for computing solutions like in model-based approaches. And you typically have massive compute to solve the problem by basically perturbing the emulator system uh, with trial and error, observing the response and learning the approximate behavior to value functions and then obtain the control policies. However, the challenges of reinforcement learning are typically scalability. You need to have a lot of data and uh, it's sometimes or very often hard to satisfy performance guarantees and safety guarantees like you have in model-based approaches. So what we see in both communities is the trend to go in the middle, to create new hybrid methods that leverage performance guarantees of model-based approaches and flexibility of reinforcement learning in the, in the coherent frameworks. And that's what we are interested in doing as well at PNL in our team. But before I provide the perspective on how we are doing that, I want to take a step back and review the landscape of optimization methods that are behind these approaches. In model predictive control, we are typically dealing with online optimization solvers. We reformulate optimal control problem in standard constraint optimization problem with nonlinear objective, inequality, equality constraints, and we are searching for optimal decision variables in this case, it's X that represent our control actions. With every new measurement of our initial conditions or boundary conditions or changing of the, of the task, we need to recompute the problem. And this happens on the fly in real time. So when you have a reliable system model, when you have sufficient compute, you can do that very efficiently, very robustly with uh, very good performance guarantees. But when you don't have these models or where you have computational limitations, it's, it's typically very tricky and you need to do a lot of scale down. Um, to alleviate this problem of the computational requirements in real time, when you have, let's say, systems, or microchips with limited memory or communication bandwidths, people try to explore what is called parametric programming, where instead of solving the optimization problem in real time with optimization solvers like interior point or active sets, you are trying to analytically construct explicit solution map that solves the problem parametrically. The uh, unfortunate side of this is that classical methods that deal with active set exploration um, of all possible combinations in your carriage contactor conditions, just they don't scale. Um, they are fairly theoretical at this stage. And here where machine learning comes. People in this domain have been using imitation learning for quite some time to approximate these parametric solutions with the regression methods or classification methods on the labeled data sets of the control parameters, like initial or boundary conditions, and map to the labeled data set of optimal decisions that are obtained by solving a distribution of the optimization problems with iterative solvers or by obtaining expert 
um, as expert solutions, let's say by human drivers. This is scalable, but it requires relatively large amount of data to cover all the parametric space and it's very hard to obtain performance guarantees because you are just dealing with simple regression problems. Um, then you still are requiring the expert to de deliver your solution. That can be expensive to have human expert or have uh, optimization problem at the first place when you don't have the model. So reinforcement learning is probably the most flexible approach where you have very little assumptions. The only thing you need to have is the system you can perturb and observe the responses and uh, the rewards to learn your critic and actor. In deep reinforcement learning, both of them are deep neural networks and the critic is just a mapping of your state action pairs into reward signals, scalar valued function of the fitness of your model. Now you can differentiate it to obtain the policy gradients. That's the whole trick that you are using automatic differentiation here. So the question is, how can we alleviate the, the obstacles of reinforcement learning for safety critical systems by bringing more domain knowledge? And how can we improve the scalability and flexibility of classical optimization based approaches by leveraging the ideas behind the reinforcement learning, which is automatic differentiation? And here we believe, and what we see the evidence in the community is that differentiable programming is an emerging unifying approach for data-driven parametric optimization, which solutions are based on automatic differentiation of complex functionals, not only uh, simple machine learning uh, functions like mean square or on, on some tracking objective. And I will quickly skim through influential papers in the differential programming landscape for scientific machine learning. This is no way extensive uh, list, so I apologize. Uh, for not having every single topic listed here. I would probably start as a very good read, a differential programming system to bridge machine learning and scientific computing. That is uh, in 2019 paper by the Julia crowd. And I think they have been one of the first to nail the term of differential programming for CIML. And we all know famous paper on physics and for neural networks for solving PDEs, neural differential equations and the extensions, universal differential equations are taking uh, various uh, dynamic systems domains by storm. And maybe not as well known, but a very active area of research is differentiable optimization, where instead of having uh, just neural network layers or some functional transformations, you are having optimization problems as differentiable layer within the network or you are using neural networks to obtain the solution for optimization problem. And then you are using methods like projections to get you to the feasible region of your equality and equality constraints. A lot of uh, work being done very recently in this space, very, very exciting. And now similar ideas can be used for control because model priority control especially can be reformulated as a constraint optimization problem where you need to satisfy your dynamical constraints that can be represented by your neural differential or differential equations and your feasible region can be represented by some polytopic constraints. So we see a lot of similarities uh, in these domains and we are building on the top of uh, these giants. And I will now present this perspective. How do we think mathematically about these problems in our team? Because we have like people from different domains, how do we bring them together to speak the same language? So we believe that this uh, parametric optimization is a good um, framework and can represent kind of a generalization of physics in neural networks. I will explain how. So we start with some objective function that is general nonlinear differentiable function that uh, is function of your primal optimizers X, X that can be like your control decisions or um, can be parameters of your differential equations you want to learn from data. And you have some scenarios, Xi, that represents your parametric uh, dependency. In physics informed neural networks, these are the collocation points. Yeah, you would sample your uh, domain space in order to obtain the inputs you are going to propagate through neural network that needs to satisfy the PDE equation residuals. But in this case, 
we are having general inequality equality constraints that needs to be satisfied and we ha have the solution map that may or may not be neural network that is mapping the parameters to the primal optimizers uh, that is parameterized by the theta this is, which is actually the variable you want to optimize in this overall parametric prog problem so if you would deal this in a classical sense you would need to pick one instance of the parameter fix the problem and uh, called iterative solver this can be very costly when you have thousands of parameters and you want to solve this parametrically over the whole domain another way is to do it it's like in similar inspired by physics for neural networks you reformulate the problem in a lagrangian form where you put your equalities and inequalities as penalties weighted penalties in your Lagrangian uh, objective function that now boils down to scalar value function that is taking basically expect, expected value over the samples of your collocation points or pair parameters. And now we have differentiable scalar value function that is amenable for gradient based optimization with automatic differentiation. So you can back propagate the sensitivities of this objective function with constraint penalties to obtain the gradients of this differentiable function, be the deep neural network that will approximate the solution of this constraint optimization problem. By the way, if there are any questions, feel free to uh, stop me and ask uh, for clarification, notation, or anything that might come to mind. Okay, so how do we solve these problems? Uh, there are different approaches in the literature. In our team, we found out there are no robust toolboxes, so we needed to code everything ourselves. Uh, but other teams are starting to emerge who, who are working on similar, uh, similar directions. So this is a very exciting time to be uh, in this research area. What we do here, we call differential parametric programming because we solve parametric programming problems with automatic differentiation. And we are developing PyTorch based toolbox. It's basically a set of classes and, uh, and functions on the top of PyTorch functionality, which we call Neuromancer. That's why the background, which, we, which, which it stands for neural modules with adaptive nonlinear constraints and efficient regularizations. Essentially, it allows us to formulate these type of problems where you have constraints, nonlinear objectives, and when you want to train neural network to satisfy these objectives and constraints given some data sets. Uh, inspiration has been taken from constraint optimization frameworks like CVXPy, PyOMO in Python, or Jump in Julia, Yalmib in MATLAB that all are based on symbolic abstractions. Like you have variable class that's the basic primitive in these frameworks and you can now symbolically construct computational graph on these variables what we are doing here that we are combining these with machine learning components like deep neural network here we have multi-layer perceptron that maps variable p into x and y and we can combine them all together and still work relatively comfortably in a high level api writing down your polynomial expressions uh, instantiating the objective functions and defining constraints without writing actual classes in PyTorch. So that's what we are developing now, like automatically parse these high level expressions into PyTorch modules with differentiable power passes that can be used um, in these Lagrangian approaches. So you aggregate things in objective constraints and components and in a couple of lines of code, you are able to formulate constraint optimization problem and now depending on the type of solver the most straightforward way is to do it with penalty functions but you can do more advanced solvers like augmented lagrangian or like you can add projection layers uh, that are differentiable within the architecture i will go through some of those uh, in the following slides but the idea is that you have now constraint optimization problem that is implemented in PyTorch as differentiable forward pass, and you can use stochastic gradient descent because it has scalar value objective function you can differentiate with Autograd. Um, we have been working on this for um, about two years from, from now, and from the computational graph perspective, from, from computer science people, you can see this mathematical formulation as the following 
a flow of information. You have some data sets. These are the parameters or collocation points or PD. And this is your neural network. And here are the objectives and constraints that needs to be satisfied. Like similarly in PD, you want to satisfy the residuals uh, of uh, those equations. And you aggregate everything in the scalar value loss function, be it penalty or augmented Lagrangian. But we are not solving PDEs. Now we are solving constraint optimization or optimal control problems. That's the idea. Um, these are just two examples of two two dimensional domains when you have nonlinear objective like given in these contours. These are the canonical test functions like Rosenbrock and Himmel Blau problem in constraint optimization. And we have non convex uh, feasible domain given by these blue constraints. Like we have this donut shape and the linear constraints, and we want to find the solution in these subspaces. Um, what we found out that we can get orders of magnitude faster online solution compared to iterative solvers like interior point because for each new variation in, in your problem when you shift your constraints or you tweak your objective function you would need to recompute the problem but when you pre-compute the problem with differentiable programming and learn explicit solution it will parametrically remember those uh, solutions that has been trained offline and just spawn you an answer by single forward pass of neural net. We are getting somewhat close to optimal solutions of these iterative solvers in this green, this is interior point, and the red is this differentiable programming approach. It's still approximation. It's not like hard constraint guarantees or hard uh, satisfaction of the uh, optimality gap. But uh, we found it still like very intriguing to follow up because we can get a lot of orders of magnitude speed up. And even if you have suboptimal solution for some application, this can be game changer, whether we can actually use it or not. Uh, in the following, I want to focus on actual architecture of this computational graph. These don't necessarily need to be fully connected neural networks. It can be any differentiable function. Um, for dynamic systems in particular, people have been using neural state space models. They can come in different shapes and and forms in classical control theory people love to use linear state space models and there are different variations when you add nonlinearities in different parts like this input dynamics this is state dynamics and this is your observable function uh, recently Koopman operators are very popular here we are just listing different architectures you can embed as a computational graph and when you replace the neural network here with neural ordinary differential equations, then with iterative solver, then you have neural OD. You can go even deeper embed domain knowledge, not only through architecture of these recurrences, you can also domain, you can embed domain knowledge in the black box components. Let's say you have neural network, but you know something about your system, especially about its eigenvalues, about the sparsity of the topology of the network. Uh, you can use a bunch of linear algebra priors that can help you to bound the singular values of the overall nonlinear transformation. Here we are showing just two examples of what we, what we call here spectral map and Perron-Frobenius map, where on the left hand side, you instead of training weights of neural network black box way, you are factorizing them in the singular value fashion. We are not solving SVD because that would be very expensive, but we are clamping the singular values in, the certain, in certain bounds and we are either designing left and right matrices to be orthogonal or we are penalizing them as a, as a regularization. So you can see again, you have additional constraints for certain properties of your layer and you are putting them either as additional turn in, in your scalar value loss function like you want to minimize the residual, like you do in pins, or you find some tricks that would allow you to do it, let's say for free by doing uh, inductive priors. We implemented uh, a bunch of these inductive priors in this open source GitHub repository, which we call SLIM, Structured Linear Maps. It's just nothing else, just checking linear algebra, writing the forward passes of of those in, in PyTorch and using them instead of weights um, as a drop-in replacement. So for any practitioner in PyTorch, feel free to uh, 
test them out by by yourself and I would be happy to receive any feedback or like potential suggestions for expansion. So that's more from from methodological and like theoretical perspective. What about practical problems um, where we can use these domain priors? One of them is modeling the thermodynamics of building energy systems, which you can represent as a multi-dimensional dynamic system. Under the hood is a partial differential equation that typically in domain sciences is discretized into different collocation points and you have set of ordinary differential equations that you can linearize and solve with, uh, with iterative solvers. Uh, this can be very labor intensive. Uh, it takes months very often to d design these type of physics based models for a single building of a single system. That's not rentable. That's not uh, scalable for large scale applications and for, for any like uh, monetary return of investment. But we can use machine learning and domain knowledge and combine them together to learn these dynamic systems from small amount of data if we, if we do it right. For instance, we can decompose the problem into different uh, different dynamical modules, like you have this abstract high level computational graph of your building model structure, where building envelope represents your walls and ceilings, basically the heat transfer to the structure. And uh, we know something about it. We know it's dissipative. What does it mean? That it wants to get to the thermal equilibria with the environment. So it's dynamically stable. Then we can construct the recurrent neural net that resembles this computation graph and has this property, which means that the singular values of this operator are bounded within the unit circle, so it's contractive. Uh, we can also know, we also know that this heating, ventilation, air conditioning systems we did represent the inputs to the building envelope delivering the heat are also bounded in certain physical space and we can use like methods through clamping or projections into certain uh, state space of of that operator. So everything now is combined together. It's no longer universal approximator. It has a lot of domain priors where the potential uh, state space that it can it can capture is limited, but it's limited uh, in a good way. You are going to learn only those parameters which you don't know, like uh, what is the specific heat transfer between the, the nodes. Uh, how does it work on some real data? Here is a very messy time series data set with 20 uh, measurements, which represents zones of the building, temperatures in each of the rooms. And we have 30 days, which is not much. It is one month of data. And we split these in three, class, in, in three components. Like we first have data set for training, 10 days. Second, 10 days we have for validation which is selecting the best model and the last 10 days for testing the performance. And this is the trajectory of the linear model where the red is the ground truth trajectory and the blue is the prediction of the model. Linear models can be very good local approximators. You can obtain the model that is valid for a certain period of time, but as the, you shift your distribution of the disturbances, operating conditions, it can blow away, it can uh, diverge from its own predictions and you would need to retrain your model with new data again. On the other hand, when you use this neural network with domain aware priors, you can get way more robust prediction because now you have your state space constraint uh, in a way you are expecting the, the behaviors uh, of your model. And you can train this to be generalizable for a longer period of time. So this has been done on like real world data with buildings with the purpose of having a reliable system dynamics model. They don't require a lot of data, but they still leverage some domain knowledge from the building physics engineers. Okay, so that's the first step. We can do forecast. What can we do with these models beyond forecast is control. But how do we do control with these complex computational graphs that are no longer fitting the frameworks of classical control where you need to have 
either state space model or differential equation. Now we have more complicated nonlinear transformations in place that are just not supported with uh, numerical solvers uh, from the classical domain. Um, on this landscape, we have been working on what we call differential operating control, where the idea is nothing else again, leverage automatic differentiation in the same way as we are doing system identification of dynamic systems or solving constraint optimization problems in Lagrangian form. So kind of the pins idea where you have distribution of your collocation points or control parameters. These are the features that you propagate through the computation graph that is consisting of the control policy and system dynamics model. This is a closed loop system. And now you see the resemblance with reinforcement learning for those people who are working in this, that space. You have actor and you have your system model, but the system model is not outside of your differentiable computation graph. It's a part of it. Now we can differentiate through the model because you have learned these differentiable transformations. This allows you to build model based value functions. You don't need to have black box neural network to represent your value function. Now you can embed prior knowledge uh, by doing reference tracking parametric equations or doing penalties on constraints and you don't need to approximate that part. So we have been working on this for, for last two years and I will show you example of this hello world in control theory, a stabilized unstable double integrator with this parametric objective function for tracking the references for state space and uh, minimizing the energy used while satisfying the boundary conditions for your control actions. Mathematically, you can formula formulate this as a parametric uh, optimal control problem where you are minimizing the scalar value loss function over the expectation of the sampled uh, parametric scenarios or collocation points in your in your parametric space over the performance objective penalties on the state and control actions subject to these recurrent e equality constraints that represents your dynamic system in this case it's simple linear system but it could be differential equation it could be neural differential equation anything that can approximate the behavior of a dynamic system. And we have this neural network that is mapping the state space and the parametric space, like uh, changing inequality constraints into control actions. And you can formulate this as a this nice computational graph that propagates the collocation points through the control policy system dynamics model, and you impose constraints on control actions, a response of the dynamics model that is unrolled over several steps ahead into the future in the model pretty control fashion. And then you have this scalar valued loss function that aggregates all together. And because every single component is differentiable, now you can compute the sensitivities with calling um, backward pass and applying simple chain rule. And this will allow you to propagate the sensitivities back to the control policy to obtain direct policy gradients. It's a very same idea that you would use in reinforcement learning where you have your actor, that's the policy, and then you have your value function, that's, that's your critic. But the critic is like basically approximating all of these components. This is just taking a step back from engineering perspective. Let's decompose the critic into system dynamics, control objective, control constraints, and put them all together in weighted objective functions. How does it work in training? We found out uh, if the problem is well posed, it can train very fast. In under 100 epochs, we can stabilize the system. Uh, you can see the trajectories on the left-hand side and policy landscape on the right-hand side. And it can train very fast without too much of the compute and a massive amount of data because you don't need to approximate the reward function or the value function. It's already embedded through physics knowledge. Okay, what happens when we don't have perfect physics knowledge of the system dynamic model or we need to train it from, from uncertain data? We have been working on extension to stochastic dynamical systems. Again, this is a hello world example with linear systems perturbed by some distributions. Uh, 
technically the idea is very simple. You are just adding orthogonally one more dimension to sample. And these are the uncertainties. So alongside the parameters, you are sampling also uncertainties and you are training the control policies to, to control the system, like in this case, stabilize to the reference or do the obstacle avoidance with uh, nonlinear constraints subject to changing parameters like positions or shape of the obstacle and varying signals of your perturbations that are sampled from some assumed distributions. This works surprisingly well without much change of the code. There are a couple of lines you add, um, but you pay the cost of having more collocation points and it becomes a little bit more expensive offline. So it's open research like what is the right way of sampling your parametric space? Uh, where do you need to sample? Like maybe on the decision boundaries of your constraints, you would need to have more sam denser sampling and in the, in the interior of your feasible region, you need less uh, dense sampling. And there are similar ideas in physics informed neural networks uh, that use like, let's say optimal transfer for answering the question. So uh, I leave it here as an open question. Um, second important topic we are working on is how do we provide some kind of robustness and stability guarantees for these type of learning based uh, controllers because everything is approximate you always get to the solution with some uh, numerical uh, threshold there will be always some residuals but sometimes in real world applications that the residuals can be difference between failing and succeeding, but the failure can have high implication. You can break the system and it would be very costly or even like uh, endangering human life. So from this perspective, there are some ideas in the literature leveraging Lyapunov functions, differentiable Lyapunov functions. Lyapunov is nothing else, there's some kind of energy function that is uh, positive definite, has trivial null space and basically is a uh, if you follow the trajectories alongside this landscape, it will always converge you to the fixed point equilibria. This is the phase space of two dimensional uh, dynamic system governing by the Apno function over this closed loop dynamics. So what we have been doing that we can learn these Lyapunov functions even if we don't know them beforehand. There are some papers that show how to design these Lyapunov functions with hard guarantees on these properties. And uh, certify closed loop dynamic systems to be converging to fixed point. So we plug them in in the closed loop dynamics and train them offline alongside with control policies. And then in the, in the real time, we can use them as certi certificates that in certain state space we are converging. We can even use them as uh, in the projections to correct our control actions in, if they will be diverging from from that certified state space. For more details, uh, please, uh, you can see our papers. Uh, and I will skip to the second topic, which is exactly in the same area of safety that is dealing with control barrier functions. The Apono functions are basically positive definite. They want to push you, your energy towards the origin, while the control barrier functions uh, you can think of them as uh, another form of energy functions that are informing you whether you are inside your feasible region of your constraints. And if you are approaching to the constraint boundary, you can trigger some behavior like uh, trigger corrective control to keep you inside. Um, again, I will skip the technical details, but uh, the ideas are very simple very simple implementation in terms of similarity with the Lyapunov functions. You just uh, formulate your control barrier function either based on prior knowledge of your system or there are some papers that learn control barrier functions from data. And these barrier functions will give you indicator of uh, the constraint satisfaction that can be uh, penalized during training. So you are like enforcing your control system to satisfy constraints offline. And then upon deployment, they can also learn as indicators for doing switching behavior. When you are approaching the safety boundary, you are going to switch to some backup controller to push you back to the feasible region. Again, details are in those papers. Both of them has been accepted for 
conference and decision control there are our recent works on safety more from control theoretic perspective and how do we uh, develop these methods from implementation perspective but once we have the landscape of tools our primary objective as a national lab is to implement them in real world engineering systems such as building energy efficient control uh, here we have simulation model of a residential building that uh, we assume that we have only time series data and some prior knowledge. So we measure the temperatures, the behavior of the control system, and we learn the surrogate model, the digital twin with this physics constraint recurrent model that we can then plug in in a closed loop dynamic system that represents polarimetric optimal control. And because we implement everything as a differentiable component, we can obtain the scalar valued functions that are fully model based and provide us with policy gradients of a neural network that can satisfy state constraints, action constraints for this higher dimensional state, um, state space with time varying constraints. So you can think of it as a as a control task with varying control objectives, yeah, to the parametric objective. Um, so example of application, what we done like a year ago was uh, this multi-zone building control. And the generality of the approach allows us to just change the system and use the same code base uh, to tackle, let's say, economic dispatch problem, where instead of the building, now we have power system network. This is, for example, again, nine bus system with generators and uh, and consumers, where you measure the voltages and your frequencies as a time series data. And in this case, we approximate the model with coupon operator with some domain priors when we know the steady states and we can regularize them uh, to those uh, converging to those correct steady states. Again, domain aware surrogate model that can be plugged in the closed dynamic system. And now we can simulate the closed dynamic system over collocation points, obtain the control objectives and compute the sensitivity of the objective with respect to neural network control policy and obtain explicit solution of this parametric optimal control problem that you would have to otherwise solve with iterative solver like interior point. This can be very expensive, especially when you are dealing with larger scale systems uh, that can take minutes up to hours to compute your solution. This means that you cannot use your real time control in practice. You can only use it for analytics afterwards. And that's the, the current bottleneck of uh, classical control approaches. But when we pre-compute the solution offline with these differentiable approaches, we can obtain five orders of magnitude speed up in real time because we don't need to solve differential algebraic equation solver and interior point solver in real time, like in, we do in model-based approaches. So this particular case gave us five orders of magnitude speed up, which is the difference between using the approach as only analytical or actually deploying it and using it in real time, controlling the, the power network. And we also found that the solution quality was not uh, lost too much. Like these are like from um, generate uh, the voltage generators from interior point, they are solid lines and dash lines are from the differential programming approach. So of course you are not nailing optimal solution, but you are getting suboptimal solution that is very close and satisfactory in terms of constant satisfaction. And, and most importantly, is actually within your uh, communication bandwidth and, uh, and sampling rate that you can use as a real time control. The last slide on applications, uh, I'm showing very to example that can serve as a proof of concept for software or control as a service. This work was done in collaboration with our colleagues uh, from University of uh, Slovak University of Technology in Bratislava. And they have this very toy laboratory device when they have ball floating in uh, the tube that is controlled by a Raspberry Pi controller. What they did, they measured the time series of data of uh, per troop system and we did system identification on our hand and used the system ID model 
in differentiable control setting, train the constraint policy offline and ship them the control policy to deploy on this uh, real device. And they need to compare this against classical methods like model priority control. But because of the computational limitations of the microcontroller, they need to sat satisfy memory bandwidth and CPU bandwidth. So they cannot use full MPC, they need to reduce the performance. So we found that pre-computing solution offline can beat online solution of iterative solvers if you have limited bandwidth. Um, in terms of reference tracking, constraint satisfaction, here we are able to deal with time varying constraints, time varying references that are in conflict often and with heavy um, heavy noise of the measurement uh, variable. That was not able to be solved with classical model predict control because of the large computational demands. But when you pre-compute it with differential programming, and then you have just neural network that you can deploy, it, and you don't need to solve the optimization problem in real time, this can be again a game changer for deploying advanced controls in devices that don't have the compute power at the first hand. Okay, so that was a blitz through different methods and applications which we are working on at PNL, but the underlying uh, methods which you binding everything together is differentiable programming uh, for constraint optimization and optimal control methods where we are dealing with uh, dynamical systems can can be approximated by neural ODs, neural state space models, and now they can be embedded in constraint optimization problems that satisfy certain properties of a convergence to fixed points or boundary conditions. And we have means to transforming those problems into scalar valued objective functions that can be differentiated with modern automatic differentiation framework like PyTorch, or you could implement these methods in Julia or or JAX in Python or in Swift. Our ongoing work is to focus more on optimization solvers, constraint optimization solvers in this differential programming setting. Um, we are working on embedding graph neural networks in the framework because it's very suitable for network dynamic systems like power system networks or building thermal networks. Having some robust uncertainty quantification that would allow you to to smart sampling of your collocation space, another uh, interesting topic. And as a community, we see a lot of different uh, research groups working on using differential programming for things like causal discovery, discovering your uh, underlying equations of the dynamic system, discovering coupling between network dynamic systems, computing sensitivity of complex differentiable graphs, doing stability analysis for machine learning models that will allow you to use in conjunction with classical physics-based principles to solve large-scale parametric constraint optimization and optimal control problems that haven't been uh, feasible with just classical methods before. So we see this as a very exciting time to do research in, uh, a lot of uh, research being done in uh, other domains and other groups, and we are looking forward for collaboration. So if you are interested in what we are doing at PNL, please see our GitHub pages. And here I would like to thank you everyone for your attention and thanks to Department of Energy for sponsoring our work. Thank you. Thank you so much for the wonderful talk, Jan. Uh, very interesting talk. Okay, uh, great. Yeah, applause. <laughs> uh, let's have a uh, the Q&A sessions. Um, if you have any questions, please unmute yourself and and, um, and ask questions. Uh, let me start with a with a question. Um, if you go to slide eleven, um, you mentioned that you know. If, yeah. Yeah. Differentiable prim parametric. Oh, was it? Yeah, yeah, exactly. So differentiable parametric programming, um, you compare the performance with the IP of uh, iterative solver, uh, you get the orders of magnitude faster online solution. So I, I was um, not clear about, okay, so in IP of you, you could, 
solve these exact formulations, um, you know, you know, the written in, in, in the left hand side. Mm -hmm. And you do compare the um, um, the performance that way. Yes, so what we are doing here is that uh, we have distributional problems that you can think of this parameter Xi uh, as right hand side in your in a, let's say you have equality constraint a x equals b and this xi can be the b vector that yeah. is changing so you're actually changing your optimization problem if you are about to solve this interior point method for each new xi you need to resolve the problem again that's the specific problem you're solving but because we want to solve this parametrically for like the family of the problems with the neural networks uh, we use uh, this Lagrangian reformulation and this pin based idea that will allow you to learn neural network that maps these parameters that in, in physics inform neural nets would be uh, your domain, your X into your into your decision variable or solution of the PDE in in pins. And that's that's the difference between offline and online solution. Of course, okay. we, are, we are paying a lot of offline cost for that. I mean, so so it's a uh, in PD constraint optimization context, there is a uh, nested approach and you know um, all at once approach. It seems like you are uh, formulating in your framework, uh, your uh, approach taking the nested approach where you embedded the uh, the you know those right hand side, for example, in linear system uh, onto the um, onto onto the domain constraint system and in offline you solve that and then feed that into your differentiable um, the programming uh, framework uh, while but but my in my head I, I think that you can also formulate that uh, with IP of and you can, you don't have to resolve the optimization as every time the you know those what it was C value or the right hand side value is changing um, by, for example, treating them as a or another optimization variable in IPO. And as those C changes, yes, then, yeah, simultan simultan simultaneously changing those C um, and the optimization variable within IPO. So I, I don't know, it's, it sounds like it's a matter of formulations. It definitely you can reformulate the problems in different ways, but in this case, we treat this xi as a, as a parameter, not as a decision variable. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that could be like initial condition or boundary condition in solving your ODE type problem or optimal control problem. And okay. typically, you cannot treat those as a decision variables because they are given by the measurements or or some uh, requirements on operational range. Right, I, I totally understood what, what you're saying. Uh, but in PDE constraint optimization, there is a, a different way of sort of treating those, the, uh, the parameter, va uh, parameter variables in, within the optimization framework, so. I see, so maybe I'm not familiar about that and I would love to hear if maybe we yeah, can yeah, yeah. leverage some of those methods in, in this approach. I would, yeah. I would love to hear that. All right, sounds good. Sounds Thank good. you. No, no, no problem. Okay, so is there any other questions from audiences? Don't be shy. <laughs> All right. Um, I found it the uh, slide 13th. Um, you know, the, the concept of, you know, introduction of the concept, the inductive prior, um, very uh, interesting, like constraining the singular values while you are doing the training. Um, I'm very interested in that. So I guess this is available as an open source code. Yes, it's available as open source. And in many of those uh, priors, we are just re-implementing published work by other groups. So we are providing the references with those papers. Yeah. Some of them we develop ourselves. Um, just uh, shopping to our old good linear algebra for inspiration. Yeah, exactly. Well, I mean, yeah. it's, it's, you know, the neural net, uh, you know, known to be a black box because we don't have a, a direct access to those uh, the singular values and eigenvalues information. But 
looks like you are um, exploiting um, those area and then uh, take advantage of it. Um, so not so much black box anymore. If, if you, exactly. If, that's if you can that's do that. kind of philosophically in our team, rather than finding uh, one ring that rules them all, one method that can solve any abstract problem, yeah. we are approaching this on per, in, per problem basis. What do we know as an engineer, as a, as aerospace or electrical engineer or mechanical engineer about the system that could inform our architecture that could inform the formulation of our objective functions with the regularization. So we, we don't learn a universal function approximator that can go anywhere. We just, we can heavily constrain the parametric space and the output space of these functions that we are learning. So it fits the domain. Right, 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 right. right. Um, but, but this framework only works for the linear uh, models, I'm yeah. guessing. Well, those transformations technically are nonlinear transformations, but they will act as a linear weights because they generate the, the linear matrices that change at each epoch. But the idea of adding inductive priors it can go beyond linear layers. So graph neural networks is one great example, like a lot of work being done there. Uh, people use universal differential equations that's coming from Julia Kraut, where they combine black box neural networks and known differential equation on the right hand side of the neural ODs, and we found this as a very powerful uh, concept as well. Nice, nice. All right. I got to dig into more about that. Um, very interesting. Yeah. All right. Okay. So, um, so people are shy today. <laughs> <laughs> Let's go to a slide. I have a question, yeah? Uh, oh, yeah, go ahead. Yeah. Hi. Uh, thanks, thanks for the talk. I was wondering, um, uh, do you uh, think about any way of extending this for like discrete action spaces? Is there any... Uh, Good question. Of... Uh, Implementation-wise, we already have that, but we didn't have a manpower and time to actually do thorough empirical tests. Uh, but. We would welcome any potential collaboration interest in like pushing forward more more applications and expanding uh, the framework method wise. So mm -hmm. discrete action spaces is our interest, but it's also on kind of uh, midterm agenda is to deal with hybrid dynamic systems when you have uh, state space under switching conditions. Mm -hmm. There are some early papers that deal with uh, neural hybrid uh, dif differential hybrid automata, where you have finite state machine that has discrete switches, but in each of the state machine states, you have differential equation. That's a very powerful concept and many engineering systems operate under these switching rules. Right, right, right. This big band or band band, right? Uh, controllers, right? Exactly, yeah. Mm. You can have a quick question. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, yeah, and this is Trunk. Really nice talk. Hi, Trunk. Hey, um, so I have a quick question. Um, Drilken to, to the current slide here, um, the structure linear maps. So here um, you have a, a general uh, neural network, which could be a nonlinear map, right? And then you can enforce the eigenvalues property on that, or, or is it only applicable to certain um, kind of linear mapping function here. I, I, I kind of have a hard time to understand this. this yes. Also. So this uh, GitHub repository slim structured linear maps are dropping replacement for linear weights in, in PyTorch that will allow you to bound those uh, singular values um, in certain uh, upper and lower bounds. But there are some papers that will allow you to say something about the eigenvalue distribution of the whole neural network when you see what type of activation functions you're using. Uh, we can, I can send you offline some of the papers that are dealing with that. Okay, so that would be great. Yeah, because yeah. It's, um, this is basically compo yeah. composition of layers and then if you have upper and lower bound of the eigenvalues of each of those layers, regardless of whether it's linear or nonlinear, then you can say something about upper and lower bound of uh, of the overall neural network. Okay, I see. Uh, yeah, so so the current slim um, toolbox here, it can be applied to kind of the linear transformation, right, uh, in neural network. Uh, okay, but it's not like yeah. the entire network from 
the input to the output, right? It's just the the layer, the the, the the linear layer there. Okay. Exactly. It's okay, a dropping replacement for linear layer, sure. but you can use it as in composition to bound the eigenvalues of the whole neural network. I see. I see. All right. Thank you so much. Thank you. Yeah. Very interesting. Okay. Any other questions? Well, sounds good. Um, if not, uh, let's thank our speaker today, um, uh, Jan. For May I ask a quick us. question? All right. Okay. Great. Oh, yeah. So this is Min right. Thanks for very nice presentation. So I was wondering when you uh, establish your uh, like control oriented model, I saw you have a forward propagating and a backward propagating. Can you ex explain a little bit more on that? I remember it's a, when you talk about the two, like the the two optimization framework? Yeah, this one. Mm -hmm. Yes. Uh, well, the idea of forward and backward pass is like uh, the, the standard in any differentiable framework, like you have neural network layers, linear or affine transformation followed by non-linearity, like classical deep neural net, and then you back propagate the scalar value loss function through this composite function, yeah? because all of them are differentiable and you apply the chain rule. Here the idea is, okay, let's replace these black box layers with something more structured. And previously I was talking about how to reform like constraint optimization problem in this structured computation graph that you can compute the sensitivities. And this is the idea of expanding that to optimal control problems where you have control policy, let's be neural network. And your system dynamics model, it can be neural OD or differential equation. And then you have some layer afterwards that represents your objective function. So instead of like having mean square error of like doing a regression function, now it's a model pretty control type function. There is like a huge family of control theory type functionals that you can place here as a domain priors. Does it answer your question? Yes. Cool. Thank you. Thank you very much. Wonderful. Is is there any other questions? I mean, we can take more questions. All right. If not, um, I let's can... thank... oh, sorry, I was unmuted. Okay, go sorry. ahead. Go ahead. Oh. Um, <laughs> I'll keep going. Sure. I have a question. Um, and this was a great presentation. Thank you for compiling so many great resources along the way too. Um, your future direction, you, you mentioned the uncertainty quantification pieces, and I want to ask what your team has been thinking about with the broader questions of, of trusting these types of systems around maybe even verification and validation and the full, um, trust credibility pipeline that goes into why a decision maker would, mm -hmm. would leverage these, these approaches. Yeah. Excellent questions. Uh, thank you very much, Erin. Mm -hmm. So. There is like a lot of work being done outside of our team, and I would like to also acknowledge that, like um, maybe in this light, um, these differentiable optimization layers is one way to do so. Like this differentiable convex optimization, you are embedding your optimization solver as a layer in your own network that has some constraint satisfaction guarantees. And uh, another one is this like. DC3 learning method with higher constraints when you leverage projections. Uh, some people call these methods deep declarative met networks or end to end constraint optimization. Uh, there is a whole landscape. Uh, projections is one approach. Uh, then, similar idea is what we have been exploring through these barrier functions. Then, you have some surrogate model that is providing you with the uh, and the fitness of not like the aggregate function, but of some safety part of the problem, like the constraint satisfaction. So if you are inside the interior of constraints, you have indicator function that you are safe. But as you are approaching the boundary, you're, you are triggering some condition that can trigger corrective action. So there are a lot of uh, technical directions that could be applied here. And I, I just don't know the answer. What is the solution it is mostly typically depends on the the requirements of the application yeah absolutely um but that's that's very helpful to help um point back directly to where some of those aspects are 
are documented. Thank you. I appreciate yeah, it. And I see methods like uh, spawning in literature like day by day. It's a very active area of research. Right. And if, you, if you know something that I forgot, please send me email. Mm -hmm. I would very love to hear more ideas. Okay, great. Thank you. Thank you. Wonderful. All right. Um, I guess one more chance. <laughs> If there is any other questions, please uh, don't be shy. Unmute yourself and ask questions. Well, um, I guess there is no more questions. <laughs> All right. Uh, let's in that case, let's thank our speaker, <clears throat> Jan Dugona uh, from PNNL uh, for giving us a wonderful talk. <clears throat> oh, what's wrong with me? Uh, thank you so much, Jan. Uh, it was really wonderful presentations. I, I'm sure um, there will be, um, um, you know, a lot of people who, who would be very interested in collaborating with you, uh, including me. So um, expect that uh, to uh, getting a lot of emails from these folks. And with that, uh, let's, uh, you know, uh, end uh, this seminar series, uh, seminar today. And our DDPS seminar next one is, I'm not sure, is this a next week or two weeks from now? Until then, um, please stay healthy. All right. Thank you, everyone. Thank you very much, everyone. Thank you, Yongcho.